when I uh, got involved with uh, looking at the Deuteronomic histories, I thought this was going to be real easy at the beginning because the first chapter in the Deuteronomic histories after Deuteronomy itself is the book of Joshua. And I had read several times in different places that as far as a historical reference, there's very little history to be found in Joshua. And uh, I thought it's going to be easy. I'll just have to rush over there and say there isn't an awful lot that we can get out of this. Well, the last couple of weeks, I've been thinking quite a bit about what I had said about, what was it, five, six weeks ago? And realized that there is a tremendous amount of history in this book of Joshua if you know how to approach it. I think I've mentioned this to you before when it comes to some of this ancient literature. What is written is probably f far less important than when it was written, where it was written, why it was written, maybe even who it was written by. And that certainly is the case with Joshua. Because the book of Joshua that we have in our Old Testament, we know pretty much when it was written, partly because of what is in, in the book and partly because of what, what the history that's associated with it. The Deuteronomic histories, you might say, were commissioned by Josiah, the king, were commissioned around 615 BC. The reason being they had a lot of data from the uh, sources like the, the Yahweh source and the Elohim source and the priestly source about some of the things that had happened to the Israelites in their earlier years. But what about some of the later years? What happened after the, after the, the Jews had got, actually got to the promised land? What happened then? And what uh, Josiah wanted was a history written about the things that transpired from the time that the Jews came to Jordan, across the Jordan River, and went into the promised land up until the present time. <coughs> he commissioned somebody to do this. We don't know for certain who it was, but once in a while I'm going to refer to somebody that I think it may have been. There's every reason to believe <coughs> that this was probably written by Jeremiah. If not Jeremiah, Jeremiah's uh, secretary, Baruch. But Jeremiah is very definitely a good possibility of being the author of the Deuteronomic histories. And uh, it probably was written around 600 and about 605 BC. And it was written for a rather uh, good reason. One of the earliest references I saw to Joshua that startled me was uh, one that was in the book, uh, The Bible on Earth by Israel Finkelstein. You're familiar with that book. And Finkelstein said that the book of Joshua is nothing but propaganda. I went back to think about that. Is this really a lot of propaganda? And in some ways, there is propaganda here. And uh, propaganda in what sense? And I'm going to be bringing this up repeatedly, and it is that, as it often is the case, things that transpire that we read about in the Bible, namely about biblical history, can be influenced by what is happening in the outside world, what's happening in the secular world. And they, uh, some of these are slides that you've seen before. This is something to keep in mind. When we take a look at the promised land, we got the northern tribes and we got the southern tribes. Let me get my pointer out here. Down in the south we have the, the tribe of Judah. And it's it's in the south. When we talk about Judah, we're always talking about the south. Up here here is Jerusalem right around this time. And the dividing line between the northern tribe and the southern line tribe is from Jerusalem, which is right near the Dead Sea here, all the way to the coastline. Up here are approximately 10 different tribes. Here there's only two tribes. The only two tribes are uh, Judah, and sometimes Benjamin is included in the southern tribes. Sometimes Simeon is also mentioned. 
when we talk about the north, we're talking about this section here of the promised land. The Jordan River is running right through here. And there's the east, there's the, the west side of the Jordan and the east side of the Jordan. Here is the other thing that's significant, and that is the, the uh, Assyrian Empire. During this whole period, the Assyrians were, were the predominant empire. The Assyrian Empire emanates, you see this darker portion here? This is the original Assyrian Empire. Its capital was Nineveh. Babylon is way down here. Samaria is way down here. This is this is Palestine in this little section here. Of course, this is Egypt. One of the things that was significant about this, the Assyrians, when they uh, captured a, a certain part of the world in the, the domination of the world, they would take the people that were in that region and transport them, get them out. These lines that you have here are the lines of the, of the deportation of the people here from the northern tribes, deported all the way. This map shows they, they bring them off to Nineveh. Actually, what some historians say, they get as far as Nineveh, and then they were even spread even further to the, to the, uh, to the, to the, to the east. And, uh, Here's the second deportation. But this idea of uh, getting the people out of the land that they are conquering was, was really quite simple as far as the Assyrians were concerned. Get them out of there and you won't have any problems with them. And one of the things that the Assyrians did is that when they transported these people or, or deported them, they would never let more than two or three families get together in any one place just to pre prevent the possibility of some insur insurrection. Let's take a look at another slide here. Okay, this shows the uh, Nineveh. This is the capital of Assyria. Here's Jerusalem way down here. This is, this is, this is Palestine right in this region right here. But as you might expect, a lot of the history is going to depend on who the rulers were. And we have quite a history of the Assyrians. The first part of this history we don't pay too much attention to. As far as biblical history is concerned, we start with Tiglath-Pileser, which is around 740 BC. He sometimes is referred to in the Bible as Pul, P-U-L, 740 BC. He besieged Samaria and died during the siege. That was the beginning of the deportation of these people. He was followed by Shalmaneser. Shalmaneser was followed by Sargon. He conquered some of the northern tribes. Shalmaneser, with the help of Sargon, actually got all the way down into Samaria and put Samaria, the city of Samaria under siege and captured it in 722. And then Sargon went on down to get, uh, get a hold of uh, Jerusalem, but he died, and before he got there, he was taken over by his son Sennacherib. The reason I'm going through this is because Sennacherib was the one that put Jerusalem under siege. This was during the time of Hezekiah, and Sennacherib put the city of Jerusalem under siege, and if you remember the story, the angel of death, according to the Bible, came into the Assyrian camp and killed south houses of the soldiers, and Sennacherib had to retreat, and Jerusalem was not taken. Jerusalem was, was saved from being conquered by the Assyrians. Sennacherib went back down to, went, went back to Nineveh, and he was succeeded eventually by his son, Esar Hayden. Esar Hayden is regarded as probably the most successful of all of the uh, uh, Assyrian emperors in that he had taken the empire to its furthest extent. Well, okay. Now, what we have in the uh, in the 
the story of the conquering of uh, what we have in the story that we have in Joshua of uh, the Israelites moving in, into Palestine. First thing they encounter after crossing the Jordan River is the city of Jericho. And the story starts out by talking about the fact that spies were sent into Jericho and the spies were aided by this woman, Rahab, a prostitute who hid the spies and protected them because they, they would have been killed if the, if the people in Jericho had gone. Why, why is this story of Rahab included here as a prostitute? Because Rahab is a very important person in the, in the Old Testament history. If you go carefully through the Bible, you find out that Rahab was the ancestor of David, and eventually we have to say the ancestor of Jesus as well. And they wanted to get her included, or, and the Deuteronomist wanted to get her included in the story that he's going to tell about, about, about Jericho. She, she is a, a resident of Jericho, of the city that the Israelites are gonna to have to take down in some one way or another. And uh, she is saved, however, because she had helped the spies in this fashion. She helped them escape. There's very interesting pictures of, of them escaping. All she had to do was hang a scarlet cord outside the, her window. And when the time came for the conquering of the city of Jericho, she, would, she and her family would be saved. Again, when we get back to the book of Joshua, we find out the next thing that occurs in the book is that the, the Israelites cross the river Jordan. And in crossing the river Jordan, they are told to pick up, they're, they're gonna cross the river from this region right here, and they come to a city called Gilgal, and that's where they landed. Here is the, the path that they had taken. And right on the other side of Gilgal is this great walled city of Jericho. And what we're told in the book of, of Joshua is that the, the river parted very much the same way the Red Sea parted for Moses. But actually, probably what had happened is that uh, there was, had been a landslide north of, north of uh, this region around Gilgal that dammed up the Jordan River that allowed the Israelites to cross over. And one thing that when they crossed over is they were told to pick up rocks and take these rocks to the other side. And there they made a monument of these rocks, the stones at Gilgal were something that the, the, the Deuteronomy history historian says, they can be seen to this day. This is, this is what they look like today. Now, these are, these are, whether these are actually the stones that were taken at that time, we don't really know, but there's a lot of evidence that there are monuments around Gilgal indicating this was the place where the Israelites had crossed the river to get into Jordan, uh, to get, get into Palestine to the city of Jericho. Now this is a picture of old Jericho. And one of the things that's characteristic of old Jericho are these walls. These walls became a very important part of the story of Jericho. Jericho is interesting for, for a number of reasons. One is it's one of the lowest parts, places on the earth. Uh, the other is one of the oldest cities on the earth. Also, it is a very prosperous town in some ways. We don't see it here, but there happens to be a spring nearby that was managed to furnish water to, to the citizens of Jericho. And what we find is that people have been living in that region from almost the beginning of, uh, of uh, the human race trying to settle down. But the other thing that was characteristic were these walls, that Jericho was protected by, by walls. Now, the people that were living at the time that the Deuteronomy historian, was, at the time that, that Jeremiah might have been writing, writing this, were living in Jerusalem. 
Jericho is not more than maybe a dozen miles or 10 or 15 miles at the most from Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, I think I, we talked about this at one time, some of the, the caves for life that they, they dug out and getting limestone, you can actually connect Jerusalem with, with Jericho. They were that close together. The people in Jerusalem were well aware of the fact that, that Jericho was nearby and that Jericho was a grand and glorious mess, that all the great walls of Jericho were crumbled down. They had been destroyed. And probably what in their minds they had concluded is that, as was common in that part of the world, there might have been an earthquake that had destroyed the walls of Jericho. And you say, well, a little fun. Here are some pictures of the walls of Jericho. These are, these are rather current pictures. I think my next slide will show the fact that they actually got tourists that, the tourists at the time of, of Josiah, at the time that the, the Deuteronomy history was being written, probably also would go to Jericho and hang around and look at all these, uh, all, the ep all the evidence of the breaking down of these walls. And here's another picture of the tourists looking at the parts of Jerusalem that had been walls at one time. Now, very likely what had happened is that, that the walls of Jericho did come from tumbling down as a result of an earthquake. That's not, a, not a unexpected. It is not unexpected also that when modern archaeologists became interested in, the, in the Palestine, Jericho was certainly one place they wanted to go to and find out as much as they could. And the earliest archaeologists back in the 1800s already were well aware of all these crumbled walls that might have resulted from an earthquake. Some very careful uh, archaeological expeditions that took place in the 20th century among them, one headed by Kathleen uh, Kenyon, went in there and very carefully tried to date when those walls might have come tumbling down. And all the evidence that they could find from a, by a number of different methods indicated that these walls came tumbling down around 200 years before Joshua could ever have been there. Joshua probably came on the scene around 1250 BC and it looks like the, the, the evidence that they were able to find at Jericho indicated that the destruction of these walls probably took place around 1400 BC, almost 200 years difference there. And this became a rather uh, accepted fact that, that the, the, the walls that had tumbled <coughs> down did tumble down all right, probably by an earthquake, but long before Joshua got there. When we read the story, the story continues with the fact that before the, before the the wall came, oh, the walls came tumbling down. You remember the story because they were the Israelites were told to circle the circle the walls six times for six days, the seventh day to stop, and then they were to blow the trumpets and then they were to shout, and the shouting brought down the walls. They were instructed, okay, Jer uh, Jericho is going to be destroyed. And when you go in to loot the city, you can take anything you want, but do not take any of the gold and silver or any of the precious metals. That belongs to God. And apparently that would have been picked up later by the priests that were present with them. However, they did not follow this commandment. And the next thing that the Israelites did was to, feeling the success they had had at Jericho, go to the next city that was available, and that was Ai. Ai. That's an easy one to spell. Ai. Ai actually means, uh, and it, it indicates a city of ruins. Again, there was something that was very evident, apparent to the Israelites, that very nearby was another city that looked at it. It had been completely, totally destroyed sometime previous to this. And what we find in the uh, book of Joshua is that when the Israelites decided to take Ai, they were defeated in battle. 
defeated badly. The reason being that when they were, had been instructed not to take any of the silver and gold from Jericho, one man did, and, uh, and as, a, as a result of disobeying the commandment, they did not have success in trying to get a hold in conquering Ahai. But after they had taken care of that problem, by the way, here's a, an interesting picture of the trembling walls. You see the scarlet cord? This is the scarlet cord that Rahab put out of the window, and her part of the walls are not affected by the by the destruction of the of the walls. Uh, here's another part of the walls. AI was completely totally destroyed. Here again, a current picture. Even to this day, there are people that have scavenged through this through the ruins. And the people in Jerusalem, the, the, the Israelites in Jerusalem and that area were well aware of Jerusalem and Ai, two ruined cities. How did this happen? And what the Deuteronomic historian did was to say, okay, here's evidence of something that happened in the past, and this is what had happened. God had been behind the, the destruction of the walls of Jericho, and God had given a commandment, and that commandment was not followed as a consequence, they had trouble when they got to Ai. But later when they followed God's command, they did destroy Ai as well. And so what the, uh, the Deuteronomy historian does is takes things that were part of the tradition of the people living there and get them involved with the book of Deuteronomy. That as long as they follow God's command, things will go well. As soon as they do not follow God's command, they will have some problems. And that's exactly what, what happened to them. So now they can look at these ruins of the past and say, okay, this is evidence of God and God's hand in our destiny here in, in the promised land. Let's see what comes next. Here is the, the loot that that man had stolen out of uh, Jerusalem. There's the burning of the city of, uh, of Ai. Now I want to talk about something that's a little bit different. Why, why all this interest in, in uh, Samaria? Well, when we go back to that history, we find out that the, uh, let me go back a couple slides. When you take a look at the list of the kings here, it's quite interesting. This list is a little different from some of the others that I've seen. We had some very strong kings, very strong rulers, like Tiglag, Pileser, and Shalmaneser, and Sargon. Esar Hayden was <coughs> probably the most successful. As a matter of fact, it will show a little bit later that he managed to take the Assyrian Empire all the way down the Nile River and, and, and got control of Egypt. And so Egypt became a part of the Assyrian Empire at one time. He was followed by Azur Banipal, and then some of the other lists, they'll list three, three kings here. And I don't remember the names of any of them, namely because they were complete total disasters. But we have an interesting situation here. Ezra Hayden, Ezra Hayden was very successful who was followed by Azure Banipal. Azure Banipal was successful in his way. He was able to take a lot of the wealth that had been accumulated by S.R. Hayden and convert it into building programs. One of the building programs was the building of the, of the library in Nineveh, the library of Azure Banipal, a library that later on was discovered by the British <coughs> as being a source of a, a lot of tablets that told us a lot about the history of Mesopotamia. But the situation here is quite interesting. A very successful king followed by a king, uh, by an emperor, Azurbanipal, who spent wildly on, on a building program. And that was followed by what? By the fact that the empire started to fall apart. Does that ring a bell at all? If you take a look at the history of the Jews, 
you see a very similar situation, namely that David was a very successful warrior. He was followed by his son, Solomon, and Solomon's probably best known for doing what? For constructing the temple and a lot of other buildings. He spent wildly. And what is the other thing that Solomon should be noted for? He was responsible for the fact that the kingdom split into the northern tribes and, and, and to Judah. In other words, it sort of fell apart. Here we find the same sort of thing happening as far as the Assyrian Empire was concerned. Uh, I heard somebody say something about history repeating itself. and uh, We may not say that history repeats itself, but sure rhymes a lot. I kind of like that expression. There's an awful lot of things that we find that are very similar. The situation here is rather, but the significant thing right here is the fact that the empire starts to fall apart. As when this empire was falling apart, that Josiah, who had been quite successful in terms of the reformation that he started after, after the discovery of the book of Deuteronomy, he was quite successful and he started to eye something, namely the fact that at one time, his ancestor David had been, and David and Solomon for that matter, had been kings of the United Kingdom, the northern tribes and the southern tribes. Why can't we not have those northern tribes and southern tribes united again to have a united kingdom? As he saw the Assyrian Empire so crumbling, he took it upon himself to say, hey, this might be the time for us to move in and reestablish our control over that particular territory that territory that later be, that we call Israel or, or sometimes is referred to as Samaria or the Northern Tribes. And one of the earmarks of uh, Josiah's reign was the fact that he always had this eye on this getting into Samaria, of get, getting those Northern Tribes back. Why? Because he felt that the, that the, the Assyrian Empire was weak because it was crumbling. Now would be the time to move in and that made pretty good sense in a sense. So there was a real interesting idea here of moving into the area that had been occupied by the Northern tribes. Now let me get this next slide here. It's America. And here's something that's from the Bible. In the days of King, king of Israel, Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came and captured these various places. And that's when he carried some of his people captive into Assyria. This is something from secular history that Josephus, the, the historian, the Jewish historian, actually mentions the fact that there did exist as far as Palestine or the Jews were concerned, the situation where there were a number of people in the northern tribes and, and, and a few people in the southern tribes. Now what about the Samaritans? Here's again is a picture of the deportation of the people from Palestine into the region to the north and to the east. Some of these people were actually transported later while well into Persia, places like that. As these people were transported out of Palestine, they leave Palestine empty. And the people that were transported were transported to another place and they had to get the people out of there. So as, as Palestine was emptied out because of the deportation, what the emperors did was to take people from other parts of the world and bring them into Palestine. And this is apparently what happened. And we get a very interesting story that appears in the Book of Kings. And the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, from various places, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. And they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in the cities. In other words, People, foreign people came into Samaria and were displacing most of the Israelites that had been taken into captive themselves. At the beginning of their 
they did not fear the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. And so the king of Syria was told, the nations which you have carried away have placed in the cave cities of Samaria. They do not know the law of the God of the land. And therefore he has sent lions among them. And behold, they are killing them because they do not know they do not know the law of the God of the In other words, these people were being killed by lions. Lions in, in Palestine, apparently there were at that time, there were, I think in another translation or another account of this, it talks not just about lions, but wild beasts. And the people that were living there said, we're having a lot of trouble here. It's simply because we do not know who is the God of this territory. And what they did was simply say, we've got to find out who it is that we have to get in contact with in terms of a God. And they came up with an interesting idea. I think they actually went to uh, the Assyrian emperor and said, can you not arrange to have some of the people that are in Jerusalem, who are priests in Jerusalem, come over to Samaria and teach us about their God? And teach us about their God, and then if we worship that God, then we will not have the problem with the lions that are killing them. Actually, these people are sometimes referred to as the lion people. Here's a picture of the lions bawling the, uh, the citizens of Samaria. So, apparently this was successful. And the Samaritans liked this so very much that they said, okay, we will, we will get involved with this God. Now, you might think what this would result in is a, a sort of a unification of the people that were transported into Samaria with the Israelites who were living in Jerusalem, but it didn't work out that way because the people in Jerusalem looked on these Samaritans who had been eaten up by the lions and were now worshiping their God as being inferior. They were... They were, some of them had Israelite blood in them because some of the Israelites had not been transported. But they thought of them as sort of half-breeds and, and they did not, did not look kindly toward the, uh, toward the Samaritans. And the result is that there's a very interesting situation that we find occurring in the Bible, a sort of an animosity that existed between the Samaritans, the people in Samaria, and the Israelites. How is this illustrated? Well, when Nehemiah was sent by the Persian uh, emperor to rebuild the walls of, Jer of Jerusalem, some of the, uh, I think one of the slides I have here, a fellow by the name of Sanballat, who was the, uh, he was the uh, head of the Samaritan tribes at that time. Sanballat went to went to Nehemiah and said, let us help build the walls. As far as Nehemiah was concerned and the Jews were concerned, we don't want any help from these half-breed Samaritans. They may want to build our walls, but we don't want to have anything to do with them. And sort of a, a sort of animosity sort of grew up between them in that way. Here's Sanballat and uh, talking probably with Nehemiah about the rebuilding of the walls. And so the Samaritans were rebuffed and uh, there was this kind of animosity. Now, later on we find that this animosity lived well into, the, into New Testament times. Here's a story that comes right straight out of, uh, I think, the book of Luke. Talking about Jesus, now he had to go through Samaria. And so he came to the town of Samaria called Sychar, near a plot of ground Jacob had given to him by his son, to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the journey, sat down at the well at about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? And his disciples had gone into town to buy food. So Jesus was alone with the, with the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? for the Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now that's, that's hundreds of years later, so this animosity shows up well into the, uh, into the New Testament times. But let me ask you a question. 
Here's, here's a picture of Jesus at the well where there was a Samaritan woman. When you, when you uh, think of the Samaritans, do you have an adjective that you put in front of Samaritan? The good Samaritan. Why? Because Jesus told a very interesting parable illustrating what the brotherhood of man really was. This is the parable, the parable, parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan that is told by Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. It is about a traveler, implicitly understood to be Jewish, who was stripped of clothing, beaten, and left half dead alongside the road. First a Jewish priest and then a Levite comes by, but both avoid the man. Finally a Samaritan happens upon the traveler. Although the Samaritan and the Jews despite each other, the Samaritan helps the man. Jesus is described as telling the, par telling the parable in response to a provocative question from a lawyer. And who is my neighbor? To this very day, there are many organizations that are involved in helping others. What are they called? Samaritan organization. It actually arises from this parable. And the parable would have very little meaning if it were not for the fact that there was this animosity that existed between the Israelites and the Samaritans. Now a question that crossed my mind was this. What if, Josiah, what if Josiah had been successful and had gotten control of the northern tribes? What was he going to do about this Samaritan question? I don't think we'll ever know the answer to that. And why do we not know the answer to that? Because Josiah got killed very shortly after this. And, it, and the uh, idea of uh, uniting the two tribes, that united the northern tribes and the southern tribes, never met fruition. The whole thing sort of perished. Now, we're going to talk quite a bit later on in the, in the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic histories about the period when Josiah was killed. It is one of the most eventful periods that we have in the history of the Jews. It's the period just before they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians and a lot of them transported to Babylon. <coughs> but uh, there was a period there. Uh, let me just give you a synopsis of what went on and then why we want to look at that more carefully. What went on is that uh, The Syrians were having a lot of trouble, largely from the Babylonians who had come from the south and had uh, driven the Assyrians out of Nineveh and out of the region that they normally lived and drove them off down to the, uh, to, to the west. Uh, it looked like the Babylonians would uh, conquer the Assyrians. That, that's all right. That's exactly what Josiah wanted to have happen. But the Assyrians made use of something else, and that is that they had developed a good relationship with the Egyptians. And the Egyptian king, a fellow by the name of Necho, had gotten together an army and to go up and help the Assyrians up in a place called Carchemish, help the Assyrians. And when Josiah found out that this Egyptian army was moving up there to help the Assyrians, he didn't want the Assyrians to be helped. He thought, I'm going to stop this Egyptian army. So Josiah gets an army himself and moves up to intercept the Egyptian army. He does so at, at Megiddo. And in a battle fought at Megiddo, uh, Josiah is killed. Josiah is killed. And that's, all, that's the end of the... Uh, attempt to get control of Samaria by, by, the, by the Israelites. Josiah is killed. And all of a sudden, we run into a situation where it, 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 uh, since the end of the dynasty of David, Josiah was a direct descendant of David. We can, we can trace his ancestry all the way back to David. But when Josiah was killed, he was succeeded by one of his sons and, well, uh, I'll get to that in a second. But when the Egyptians had killed Josiah, they also got control of Jerusalem. And for a while, we find that Jerusalem was under the kingship, was under the rule of the Egyptians. When Josiah was killed, his son was made the new king. 
but it was only a matter of weeks before the Egyptians said, no, we're not going to let him be king, and they transported that new king off into, uh, into Egypt, and the, and the Egyptians appointed their own king. So the Egyptians then had control of Jerusalem. This would have been around 608, 609 BC. But up to the north, the Egyptians had been helping the uh, Assyrians, and the Babylonians didn't take too kindly to that. And a battle resulted between the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And this was the Battle of Carchemish. And in that battle, the Babylonians defeated the Egyptians, and the Egyptians had to flee and go back into Egypt. And all of a sudden, the people in Jerusalem were no longer in control of, uh, of, of, of Egypt, but the Babylonians were in control of Jerusalem, but the Babylonians were. So in a matter of a, just a couple of years, they had gone from independence to being vassals of Egypt, and now they were vassals of Babel, Babylon. And uh, and it wasn't too long before the Babylonians actually moved into Jerusalem and took a lot of the people into captivity. Now, we know an awful lot about that material, about that part of, that part of the history of the, of the Israelites. Why is it? Because a lot of it was written up very carefully by a guy named Jeremiah, who might have been the one that was going to write in the Deuteronomic histories. And the interesting thing about Jeremiah is that he was there at the time of all these things were taking place in terms of uh, the Egyptians getting control, the Battle of Carchemish, and then subsequently the, 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 the Babylonians and actually taking the, the Israelites into captivity. What makes this rather interesting is that not only was Jeremiah a first-hand observer of all these things, he was also an extremely good writer, as was his secretary, uh, Baruch, and he was also a participant. And when we get into this a little bit further, we'll find out that Jeremiah was very much involved in some of the things that happened during that rather tumultuous period of about five or ten years when they went from Egyptian control to Babylonian control and then deportation into Babylon. Let's see what else we got here. Here's the Good Samaritan. A little bit more about the Samaritans. They were very much intrigued with the, uh, the success that they had had in, in listening to what these people had told them about their God. The Israelites told them about their God, and the, and the, the Samaritans said, okay, we will follow that God, and they, they formed their own religion, and they actually wrote their own Bible. And here's a, here's a Samaritan priest with a Samaritan Bible. It was not the same Bible as the Old Testament, but the first five books were the same. The Pentateuch that we have in the uh, Old Testament was the same as the Pentateuch that, that the Samaritans had. But the next slide tells you an interesting thing about it. I like this statement. I saw this. The Pentateuch, the Old Testament Pentateuch, or the Masoretic text that we have in our Bible and the Samaritan Bible are very similar, very similar, except very different. And here we have a statement. Some 6,000 differences exist between the Samaritan and the Masoretic text. Most of these are minor variations in spelling of words or grammatic corrections, but others involve significant changes such as the uniqueness of Mount Gerasim. If we go back to that uh, story of Jesus with the, with the woman at the well, at Jacob's well, uh, the story says that Jesus says to something to the woman that we differ from you, and that is that we Jews in Jerusalem, we worship at Mount Zion in Jerusalem. You worship at Mount Gerizim which was a mountain not too close, from, not too far from Shechem. And that, that was one of the real big differences. I believe it was also found that the, in the Samaritan Bible that when, when Abraham takes Isaac up to be sacrificed on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, it doesn't do it in, in the Samaritan Bible, it's on Mount Gerizim. Again, there was that difference. But it's very interesting that the... Uh, 
there is the, so much similarity. The last bit here I think is quite interesting. Throughout their history, the Samaritans have made use of translations of Samaritans, the Samaritan Pentateuch, into Aramaic, Greek, and, and Arabic. And when you study biblical history, you'll find very often references that are made that this is what was found in the Samaritan Bible. The Samaritan Bible was translated in, into these different, it was translated into Greek. The Jewish Bible was translated into Greek. And what do we call that? Remember that that's the Septuagint. That was the Jew. That was the Greek translation of the of the o Old Testament. But there was apparently a Greek translation of the Samaritan Bible, and so you could compare what the what the Samaritans had to say with what what the Jews had to say about various things. I think I have one other item here. Oh, this is another part of what we discussed last week. One of the more interesting things that we find in the book of Joshua is the fact that there was a battle that involved the Israelites against the army from Jerusalem led by Adonai Zedek. And in that battle, Joshua commanded the sun to stand still. Remember that story? First there were stones that were stoning these people. And then the sun stood still. And how was that uh, regarded? Well, it was regarded as the sun standing still and the moon, moon standing still, that neither of them moved. Does that sound reasonable? What would happen if the, were, if, the, if the earth were suddenly to stop rotating? What do you think would happen to the Pacific Ocean? It probably would cover uh, the west coast of the United States in a very short time. <laughs> and the idea that, that the actually stood still didn't take place. There were people that had believed for a long time that the thing that actually had happened when the sun stood still was when the moon covered the sun and what they were looking at was a solar eclipse. Something I just recently came across. Here's a picture of the solar eclipse again. About 10 or 15 years ago, well, let me ask you this question. How many of you remember the eclipse of a couple years ago? How many of you expect to see another one very shortly? Because it's a very selected area in which we actually see a total eclipse. What I also found interesting is that in watching that eclipse, the, the astronomers were able to tell us just exactly when this would start and where we should start to see the eclipse because knowing something about the inclination of the, of the Earth and, as it revolves around the sun and knowing something about the, the time of day, how long uh, uh, it takes for the, the Earth to re revolve on its own axis, it's very possible for them to tell where an eclipse might take place and when it would take place. If we could do that for the future, guess what some of these astronomers also decided? They could also do it for the past. And some astronomers in Britain had done this, and they found that there was an eclipse. That they scheduled it taking place on October the 30th of 2007. And I think on my previous slide here, this is the area that it covered. You notice that it goes right through Palestine here. Palestine's right here. Here's the Egyptian, uh, here's the Nile River, here's the Sinai Peninsula. And uh, at the time, there was a lot of excitement because this was one of the first references, a secular reference to an eclipse playing a role in, in, in mankind's existence. And the interesting thing is that the time that they it came up with is 1207 BC. This would have been very, very close to the time that Joshua and his people had moved across the Jordan River into, into Palestine. And they say that this is not only a, a good indication that they were quite accurate in determining where that eclipse would have taken place, but when it would have taken place, and it would have taken place during a time that it was recorded in the Bible itself. 
Now, when we go to the rest of the book of uh, Joshua, we find that one of the last chapters in the book of Joshua, it's chapter 24, that talks about the fact that there was a very important council that was held by representatives of all the different tribes indicating that what they would do was would adopt the religion that was being practiced by the people that were living in Shiloh. Next week we're going to take a look at the book of Judges and the first chapter of the book of Judges is quite revealing in some ways as to what might have happened. Let me just pose you what the question is of what we're going to try to look at next week. If you take the fact then that uh, Jacob and his family moved into Egypt about 400 years before the time of Moses. And then when he moved into Egypt, there were 72 uh, members of his family. And if we assume that each family had two men and each of them begat two men, and we take a period of 400 years, it's not impossible to come up with a number that you find in the book of Exodus that the number of men that Moses led out of Egypt was 600,000 men plus women and children. 600,000 men plus women and children probably is gonna come over, over two million people. There's no evidence that anything like that actually took place. But here is a fact. If, if Jacob did move with 72 men in a period of 600 years, in a period of 400 years, it could very well be that Jacob's family might have grown to 600,000 men. And the question is, how did those 600,000 men all end up in, in Palestine, in the Promised Land, and have, have a background that says that we came from Egypt? How did this come about? We'll talk about that next week, about what probably did happen. What we have in the Old Testament about the, the migration out of Egypt and crossing the Red Sea is again somewhat fanciful. But the fact remains that a tremendous number of people had been in Egypt at one time were now living in Palestine. How did this come about? And why, why do we have the, all the Jews in Palestine with a background of having been in Egypt and looking at the fact that they had been brought out of Egypt were now in the Promised Land? So next week we'll start looking at the book of Judges a little bit. But keep in mind that there may be a lot of things about the book of Joshua that do seem to indicate that it's not the best place to go to try to find evidence of uh, history. You can see how tempting it would be that these ruins of Jericho and Ai were there and that archeologists would like to go in there and try to find out when did this take place? Is there evidence that this is something that is biblical, that we have these ruins right now? Uh, the, the, the kind of evidence that was accumulated did include some carbon-14, but it also included looking at a lot of the relics that they could find in, in the old Jerusalem and uh, pottery and things of that sort. Next week we'll talk a little bit about, about that as well. Any questions? <coughs>